Lord, thank you for today. Jesus, thank you for the message that it's not us, but it's you in us that the impossible is done. We just give you this time. In Jesus' name, we love you. And we bless you. And it's for your kingdom that we seek. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so I'll send that link out to you guys. Um, the individual stories of those people are very powerful. Um, uh, Tyrone Flowers, I've shared before. Uh, Brian Birdwell, that was powerful. Um, and then... Um, uh, so... Uh, I get, Leary, were you going to share as well? Okay. Um, so, can I just share something real quick? So, the Holy Spirit, throughout our worship time, um, it's like, I, I didn't plan the songs. I, I had no set list this week, except the one song by Michael Ketterer, he also has an I am second uh, testimony. Uh, he was on American Idol, adopted a bunch of kids, um, especially one that uh, was special needs, was blind and had physical issues. And uh, then he was healed of his blindness. And that he, um, I think he had like a shaken baby syndrome and they adopted him from the hospital. Um, Rodrigo, amazing testimony. And, and then the song Spirit Lead Me. Um, <clears throat> but First Corinthians, excuse me, Second Corinthians five, verse eleven. Therefore, because we know the fear of the Lord, we seek to persuade people. Knowing involves intimacy. We are intimate with the Lord, therefore we persuade people. We are completely open before God, and I hope. We are completely open to your consciences as well. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to be proud of us so that you may have a reply for those who take pride in the outward appearance rather than in the heart. For if we are out of our mind, it is for God. So if we're crazy, we're nuts, that's God's job. That's God's business. If we have a sound mind, it's for you. It's for your understanding, your reception. For Christ's love compels us, constrains us, controls us. We have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves. Because before Christ we were living for ourselves. And God had to put physical restraints on us through the Torah. But for the one who died, uh, rather, uh, he, and he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. It's not we that live. We were dead in our trespasses. So he raised us up and he owns us. You don't live for yourself. It is not I, but through Christ in me. It is not I, but the power of Jesus that we can endure. Like Bethany Hamilton got her arm bit off by a shark. Or Tyrone Flowers gets shot at point-blank range with a 357 Magnum. That's... And then... And then forgiving his his attackers saying I forgive you these are impossible stories folks we serve an impossible God he did it for love he did it for you he did it for me because he loved because he loved because he loved he put himself in our place for love it's his love it's his love that compels us. It's because he loves. That's why we have to preach the good news. It's because 
he loves. It's why we, we say what we say, we do what we do. It's because he loves that we take the risks that we take. It's why we give our hearts out and say, okay, I'm going to choose to forgive. It's because of his love that we say, here, somebody borrows and never returns. It's because of his love that we have an injustice against us, people wrong us, and we say, I love you anyway. I forgive you. That's why we love. Because it's His nature. So Father, it's because of Your love in us. That's why we come to You. Because of Your great... Because of Your great love that we are attached to You and we'll hold on to You. Because of Your great love that we continue on day in, day out in the crazy things you ask us to do, in the faithful things you ask us to do, in the boring, seemingly boring things you ask us to do day in, day out. It's because of your love. Oh, Jesus, don't let us grow weary in doing good. Oh, bless us this time that your name be glorified, that you would Prepare those who are to receive your powerful, powerful words. Your powerful presence. Oh God, that you would restore the hearts of the fathers to the hearts of the children, lest you come and strike the land with a terrible curse. Oh God, protect this land, this nation against the uh, infiltration of the enemy. Father, that you would honor our dear brother George Washington and all of those faithful prayers that they've prayed to hold this country together. People who have bled and suffered and died. Jesus, I pray that you would not allow their lives to go in vain. That their righteous blood would cry out against the injustices of this nation, of the perversion, of the uh, gender confusion, of the abortions, of people managing their life without asking you, not just for the great things, oh God help me because I'm going to lose my house, but even, oh Lord, where do you want me to go for a job? What do you want me to do? Lord Jesus, help us return back to you in the little things, because it's those little things that you count. How we do the little things or how we do the big things. Oh Jesus, turn this nation once more. Oh God, that you may save more souls. And America shall be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, um. <clears throat> seal 6. I want to start though with Seal 5. Um, because it's the place of intimacy and that's where uh, knowing God begins. And in Seal 5, you have the people who had suffered, um, who had given all, they had sacrificed for the Lord, and they uh, experienced the death. Um, they had been gathered under the throne of God, and they were sheltered there. And they were told to wait, to rest, and they were given a beautiful white robe to wear. And that's where we left them. And it's there that they learned intimacy with God, in that hidden place, in that quiet place. You know, the five is a, a number of grace. It's like an open hand given to us. And it's gracious that the Lord would allow us to know Him. It's gracious that He would draw us into His very throne room and allow us to speak to Him and know Him and love Him and to learn of Him and to understand who He is and His heart. And so they start out with the cry, Sovereign Lord, holy and dependable, how long before you judge those who live on the earth and vindicate our blood on them? This is the cry of righteous Abel who um, died at the hand of his brother Cain. He had offered a more acceptable sacrifice. And the, the blood 
was crying from the ground, Jesus said, of Abel. And it, it was a right cry, and God is a just God, and he will take vindication on the wicked. But they're told to rest a little while longer. And so you see the Father's heart. He said, there's more who are coming like you. So wait just a little bit longer until all of your brothers and sisters and the servants will gather in, will be gathered just like you were. Because they've got to go through some things still yet. And so there's a waiting that happens and an intimacy that happens as they are waiting there, sheltered by the altar. I believe that's the altar that Yeshua is ministering at before the throne of God, where he's ever making intercession for us, where he's doing his work there, his kingdom work. And then we are invited to participate in that work. You know, that was the plan, right, from the Garden of Eden was that man would work with God in communion with him. They weren't, God didn't give them a job and say, go off and do your thing, come back when you're done. The picture was that God brought the animals to Adam and Adam named them. There was an interaction that was going on between man and God. And then they talked about it in the cool of the evening. You know, there was a communion that was going on. And so there was always this connectedness communion that was going on between man and and God. And we are invited into the office of intercession with Christ. And it's a privilege. It's working with Christ back in in sort of Edenic style. So we get to seal six and if seal five is about int- intimacy, seal six is about what goes on in the work of the world. And um, we'll just read the passage. This is Revelation six, um, starting in verse twelve. And behold, I saw the Lamb break open the sixth seal, which released a powerful earthquake. I saw the sun become pitch black, and the full moon became blood red. The stars fell from the heavens to the earth as a fig tree shaken by a stormy wind sheds its unripe figs. The sky receded with a snap as a scroll rolls itself up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. And then the kings of the earth and its great princes and generals, the rich and the poor and everyone, whether they were slave or free, ran for cover and they hid in the caves among the mountain boulders and they called out on the mountains and the boulders saying fall on us at once hide us quickly from the glorious face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand so six is related to this idea of work it was on the sixth day that man was created and all the land animals they were all created and of course man was set in authority over the earth to rule the earth originally they were intended to govern the earth in the same character and nature of God they were to be a light to to the world uh, at that time nature but with the fall they handed the authority of the earth over to Satan, and he became the ruler of the earth. And as the ruler of the earth, uh, he had his own set of rules, and they were performance-based. Um, if you didn't didn't pass the muster, then you were made to feel guilty and shameful. There was always a question of security. There was always a question of rejection. And these things became part of of mankind. So um, man tried to discern how the best way to live was. And they began to look up into the stars for ideas. They made a complex system of gods up um, based off of the sun and the moon and, and the stars, the heavenly host, some of the animals below. 
and they began to try to serve those gods, um, believing that if they presented certain sacrifices at certain times and certain ways, that the gods would be happy and they would bless them. And it was always, if you do good, you will be blessed, and if you do bad, then you will be cursed. This is the way every religion works. Um, that is of the world, under the world system. Every religion has a um, scales of, of, you know, good versus bad. Um, so when the earth quakes and it it, be, it shakes everything, it shakes the whole world foundation, the whole earth foundation. And the very sign that was given to show us what to see, how, how, how reality is, is from our perspective becomes completely black. And the, the picture is, is that you can't see anything. There's no light in which to guide your life by anymore. And the moon, which was to be a reflector of the sun's light, of whatever your belief system was, and I'm talking in broad terms now, but the moon that was supposed to be re the reflector turned blood-like. It, it, they, they were guilty because they couldn't see any longer. They were doing things in guilt because they couldn't see. The stars, they fell from the heavens to the earth. That is, all the idols and, and, and divinations and prophecies and everything that they knew and understood about life and how it worked fell to the earth and was literally crumbling around them. Down they didn't know what was up and what was down, and they got all turned around. There was no direction. It was as if a stormy wind had shed the unripe figs from the fig tree. And it, it brings in this fig imagery, which just brings us back to um, the Garden of Eden, where uh, the people of Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves, their sin, their rebellion, with fig leaves. Here, these, this fig tree had uh, produced immature figs, and, and a strong wind blows them all off. And that's the way all these idols are sort of falling. It's just a wind that blew, and they just all fell. And um, it has been suggested, um, Gil as a commentator, on the scripture said that uh, hypocritical teachers of uh, the law and of the early church were likened unto unripe figs. So it's sort of an interesting connection. Um, then the sky receding up as a snap, like a scroll rolls up on itself. This is, that's where we started, this whole thing, that uh, the lamb would unroll the scroll seal by seal. And now the plan is done and it's just whoosh, all closed up. Everything that was of this world order it just rolls back in on itself. And the result of all of this, uh, when we had the mountains that were fleeing, mountains throughout Revelation are uh, a picture of um, uh, symbols of... Uh, Structures um, like media or religion or politics or um, the sort of societal structures, yeah, spheres of influence, if you will, and they they're crumbling. They're crumbling. Everything that we've built up for us to to live in as a society is crumbling as a mountain, as a stronghold for us. The islands is that self-sufficiency. I'm able to stand alone all by myself. And those things are the things that are destroyed. And it leaves the people, uh, whether they are great or small, the kings, the princes, the slaves, the rich, the powerful, everybody, they're all hiding in the rubble of the constructs that they had built of society. All those different little kingdoms that they had built to protect them and, and make their life make sense. All those things are cr are crumbled, but they're hiding amongst them, just like Adam and Eve hid amongst the trees when they heard the voice of God in fear. And so the, le the field is leveled. The playing field is leveled. Um, all people are just back to being just human, and all the status and all the money and all the power is all gone. 
all of that has, has been wiped out. But what they say is really interesting. They, they don't cry out to God. They cry out to their mountain rubble, to their boulders, and they say, fall on us at once. Hide us quickly from the glorious face of the one seated on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. So they're crying out for their broken systems, not to save them, but to hide them, because they don't want to see God. Now, these are not unreligious people. These aren't pagan people. They, they know who's on the throne, and they know the Lamb who's with them. They, they can identify him, and they are afraid of seeing him. I don't think these people were pagans. These people knew who was up there, seated in the heavenly places. And they knew that they had ticked off God. There was wrath. Wrath from the Lamb, and then wrath from um, the Lamb and the one seated on the throne. So the Lamb gets double portion of wrath. And, and I suppose maybe that's because he both created and redeemed those people and they turn their back on that creation and that redemption. You know, it's sort of funny. I've never seen a wrathful lamb. Uh, Lambs are generally frolicky and fun and sweet and kind, but this ram or lamb has wrath because he was slain and his redemption was spurned. His way was spurned. Who can stand? Who is able to stand when their wrath has come? And this is the posture that we, that the rest of the earth is experiencing. I can't help but believe that, that these people are right in line with, like, Cain. You know, if in Seal 5 we hear the cry of Abel, who is, his blood has been spilt by Cain. And then God comes to Cain thereafter and he says, where's your brother? You know, prior to that, he actually encouraged Cain. He said, don't, don't do this. You've got to master this sin. It's, it's right there at your door. If you did what was right, wouldn't I accept you? And, of course, Cain doesn't. And so he ends up killing his brother because he allows that hatred to stay in his heart. And as a result, uh, Abel is, is gone. And now when God comes to Cain, Cain is, is like, you're going to cause me to wander from you. This is too much for me to bear. The, you know, woe is me. And God sends him away. Um, he doesn't curse him directly. Cain puts that curse upon himself. And I believe the Lord was waiting to see if he would come back because he has a father's heart even towards Cain. But in in the heart of Cain, there was this sense of, I've got to kill the ones who are doing it right because I have to establish my own self-righteousness. And this is this fight that is there. You see the same kind of fight in the Pharisees against Jesus. They had a certain idea of how life should run and they had a self-righteousness that was there and when Jesus comes on the scene and he is the righteous one of God they couldn't stand that and so they had to attack him and when they couldn't attack him and get him to be quiet you know they couldn't get him on his side on their side and so the only thing they were left with was to kill him which they did hoping to quiet him and it's it's that Cain type, I believe, that the righteous ones are crying out against. So how long are we going to have to wait? You know, this this was uh, foreshadowed back in the letters um, at the beginning of Revelation. And in the letter to Philadelphia in particular, uh, which is in Revelation 3, he says this um, in verse 8, I know all that you have done. Now I've set before you a wide open door that no one can shut. For I know you have a little 
Uh, you possess only a little power, and yet you've kept my word, and you haven't denied my name. By the way, that was the indicator for the Seal 5 guys, was that they kept the word of the Lord and didn't deny Messiah. Watch how I deal with those of the synagogue of Satan, or the adversary, who say they are Jews but are not, for they're lying. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and acknowledge how much I've loved you, because you have passionately kept my message of perseverance. I will also keep you from the hour of proving that is coming to test every person on the earth. But I come swiftly, so cling tightly to what you have, so that no one may seize your crown of victory. For the one who is victorious, I will make to be a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, permanently secure. I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, descending from my God out of heaven. And I will write my own name on you. So the one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is now saying to all the churches. So here you have a group of people who have been persecuted from within the church, who say that they are of God, but are not. And he says, I'm going to make a distinction and let them know that I love you. And they will come down and bow at your feet, recognizing that fact. So after this view of the earth and what's going on there, I, I like to think of this sort of as an O oh, stink moment for them. They, it, it is in the same vein as when Christ was crucified. He breathes his last, the veil is torn, and the centurion looks at Jesus and goes, we just killed the Son of God. There's this revelation, and I think it's that sort of that same feeling, oh no, I just screwed up. In fact, even um, when the people were there before Pilate, they said, let his blood be upon us. Right? And so it's that the the righteous blood falling upon them. Um, this, this is sort of what the earth climate is. But, but what's going on with that uh, in heaven is a little different. So in heaven, um, it says here in chapter 7 after this, that actually could be translated in the midst of this or between this or whatever. Um, so there's a lot of ways you could do that. If you think of it as happening at the same time as what's going on down on earth, you see angels who are standing at the four corners of the earth and restraining the four winds so that no wind would blow on the land or the sea or any tree. Another angel ascending from the east, which is the place of blessing and the sun rising and so forth. Jesus is the rising sun, um, the morning star, who had the seal of the living God. And he shouts out with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to damage the earth and the sea, saying, don't damage the earth, the sea, or the trees until we've marked the loving servants of our God with a seal on their forehead. This is the end here of this seal, is that they get marked, set aside, and they have the very mind of Christ upon themselves. They are now moving in that vein. Um, and I discovered that the number of those who were sealed uh, was 144,000 sealed out of every tribe of Israel's people. And, and that was unique because um, the whole beginning of this was that that was the intent, was that there would be those from every tribe and language and nation who are sealed, and, and it actually goes into that, but particularly out of Israel. The 144,000 is, a, um, I think, a magnification, 12,000 times 12,000, but it's a magnification of the eldership that's up in, in the heavenly places. There's 24 elder, elders, 12 perhaps representing those saints who were before the cross and then 12 thereafter, okay? 12 from uh, those who were pre-Messiah to 12 who came after Messiah. And it's a magnification of that and then a multiplication of that because there's a whole host in heaven that are witnesses who have all gone through the same kind of walk of faith, of sacrifice, and of um, preferring God's ways to their own. And they walked in intimacy with God. Hebrews has a nice long list in chapter 11 of the ones who were the forefathers of faith, if you will, who walked this out. 
and were commended by their faith. And of course, the Acts of the Apostle has many, many stories um, of those who did so after Christ left. And then it goes through the the marking and who was marked. I'm not going to go through that at this moment, um, but it tells a story. Each of those names tells a story of the maturing of the saints, and that's really what's happening at during this the seal six thing. There are things that are happening on the earth, and it causes the people to, uh, when they see their systems crumble, to hide. But those same exact things that are experienced by people who are sealed and they have the mind of Christ, they don't hide. In fact, they are living in the reality of being seated in the heavenly places in intimate union and communion with God. And so instead of hiding, what is said of them is uh, in Revelation 7, 15, they are the ones who have washed their robes made them white in the blood of the Lamb, and have emerged from the midst of great pressure and ordeal. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, ministering to Him as priests day and night, with a cloud-filled within the cloud-filled sanctuary. They are not just in intimacy, but they're working. And their work is to minister before the Lord. They are in that intercessory place with Christ. And they're they're not just praying for themselves. They're praying for that which is going on around them in the world. And anything that is on the Lord's heart, they know the Lord's heart because they have intimacy with Him. And He's the one who spreads over them a shelter. It says that um, the enthroned one spreads over them His tabernacle shelter. Their souls are completely satisfied. There's nothing lacking in them any longer. Neither the sun nor any scorching heat will affect them, for the Lamb at the center of the throne continuously shepherds them unto life, guiding them to the everlasting fountains of the water of life, and God will wipe away from their eyes every last tear. Paul sort of echoes this in um, 2 Corinthians when he's talking about the, the treasure that is in um, a clay jar. He's, he likens himself unto um, just a common jar in Second Corinthians 4. He says, we, that is the apostles, are like common clay jars that carry this glorious treasure within us so that the extraordinary overflow of the power will be seen as God's, not ours. Though we experience every kind of pressure, we're not crushed. At times we don't know what to do, but quitting is not an option. We're persecuted by others, but God has not forsaken us. We may be knocked down, but we're not out. We continually share in the death of Jesus in our own bodies so that the resurrection life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. We consider living to mean that we are constantly being handed over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. So then death is at work in us, but it releases life in you. And you see, they're participating in this work that Christ first did on the cross, but they're now continuing in that giving of their own life, their own physical life, for the life of others. And that is the work of six. That's how the kingdom is built. So, um, in verse 16 he says, So no wonder we don't give up. For even though our outer person gradually wears out, our inner being is renewed every single day. We view our slight, short-lived troubles in the light of eternity. We see our difficulties as the substance that produces for us an eternal, weighty glory far beyond all comparison because we don't focus our attention on what is seen but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but the unseen realm is eternal. And I think that's the biggest thing about this particular section is that the vision is no longer on the earth anymore. The people who are of the Lord are now seeing themselves. They have really grasped, I'm in the heavenly places with Christ, ministering there. And while their bodies may be on the earth, that is just an extension down 
their hearts and their minds and their perspective is of God. It's heavenly. They've been sealed in their head to have the mind of Christ. And so they see as he sees. They hear what he hears. They feel what he feels. They have the heart of God. And they're reaching down into the world to minister as Jesus ministered when he was walking on the earth. They're participating in his work. Now, there's a concept uh, with the of being the the priest, which is that sort of an intimate, close relationship with God. It's a reclin- reclin- um, reconciliation, a ministry of reconciliation between God and man, and and there's an intimacy that comes with that, a, a special holiness and purity that comes along with that. It's a hidden thing. There are places that priests can go that normal people can't go and that kind of thing. It's also that priesthood is also related to the bride. In fact, we're called the bride of Christ because we are allowed into the, the intimate places with Christ. He's, he's literally within you. And he knows your heart and you know his uh, as you commune with him. And and you grow in that relationship with him. You can hear his voice and, and he, um, there's just sweet times of communion with him. So this is a picture that's used. But there's another picture that is more closely related to working. And and that is the the picture of the kingdom builder the one who's working and laboring in the harvest for the harvest, uh, the master of the field, the one who is the um, the eshet chayil, uh, the valiant wife. It's it's when you go from being the bride to the wife that begins to help uh, as a helpmate the husband to establish his home and to build up the family and to. Um, do the things that he's called to do. It's the Davidic kingdom spreading out and not just establishing Israel's borders and kicking out the the things that have infiltrated, but actually going out and expanding those borders and, and taking dominion in that area. It's that picture. And, um, and so that's really what's going on at this point. From the world's perspective, things are falling apart. People are hiding. But from the heavenly perspective, there's a security that happens and they will not be touched by the things that are just driving people to fear in the earth. Um, The section where he talks about the weeping and how God will wipe away the tears from people's eyes, that's actually um, restated from Isaiah See if I can find it. Because I am not following my notes at all. Isaiah 25. Do I have a Bible that has Isaiah in it? Yeah, right here. I got it. Thanks. Isaiah 25. This is. Um, <coughs> Regarding the the judgment of the Lord, and um, it says this actually starting in um, he talks about how all the earth will be judged, but uh, in chapter twenty four and then verse twenty one he says on that day the Lord will punish the host of heaven above the kings and the earth below. Um, that would be both the, the idolatrous gods and the rulers and leadership of this earth. They'll be gathered together like prisoners in a pit. They will be confined to a dungeon. After many days, they will be punished. The moon will be put to shame. The sun disgraced because the Lord of hosts will reign as king. On Mount Zion in Jerusalem, he will display his glory in the presence of his elders. I mean, you could almost take that and just plop it into Revelation. Yahweh, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have accomplished wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. You've turned the city into a pile of rocks, a fortified city into ruins. The fortress of barbarians is no longer a city. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, a strong people will honor you. The cities of violent nations will fear you. This is all the people who are left in the world. 
um, they are going to honor the Lord because they will see what God has done. For you've been a stronghold for the poor, a stronghold for the needy person in his distress, a refuge from the rain, a shade from the heat. When the breath of the violent is like rain against the wall, like heat in a dry land, you subdue the uproar of barbarians. As the shade of a cloud cools the heat of the day, so he silences the song of the violent. And so this the heat that's talked about in Revelation is, is identified with the oppression of the wicked who are um, trying to force the people of God who are poor um, to bend to the ways of the world. And they're resisting against that. It's, this is just like those Ephesians where they're being oppressed and they're being um, slandered against and and they're dealing with persecutions. And he says, I'm going to o'ershade you. Um, Then he says, the Lord of hosts will prepare a feast for all the peoples on the mountain, a feast of aged wine, choice meat, finely aged wine. On this mountain he will destroy the burial shroud, the shroud over all the peoples, the sheet covering all the nations. Um, you could also call that shroud uh, like a veil. It's a veil that is cut in um, in uh, the temple so that there would be direct communication between God and the Holy of Holies into the holy place. Uh, the presence of the Lord was now opened up there. Or the veil that is um, referred to where Paul says that there's a veil over the people's faces when they're reading the law of Moses, that veil being removed, so now they can really understand what it is that they're reading. reading. They can really see God for who he is. That will be destroyed because death will be destroyed forever, verse 8. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face and remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken it. And on that day it will be said, look, this is our God. We have waited for him and he has saved us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. For the Lord's power will rest on this mountain. So there's a mountain that's established by the Lord. It's a structure that replaces all the structures of this earth. This is his kingdom come. His mountain. The Mount of Zion. But Moab... Um, And there always seems to be the but in Isaiah. But Moab will be trampled in his place as straw is trampled in a dung pile. He will spread out his arms in the middle of it as a swimmer spreads out his arms to swim. His pride will be brought low along with the trickery of his hands. The high-walled fortress will be brought down, thrown to the ground, to the dust. And Moab is the uh, progeny of the ancestrous relationship between righteous Lot and his daughters. And so you have that mixture and the Moabites all the way throughout the history of Israel were trying to get Israel to mix and to uh, pollute the true word of God, to pollute the religious uh, expression that God said, this is the way I want to be worshipped and to just you know do something a little different. And um, he says, no, they will be trampled underfoot. Those who keep trying to insert their own ways of worshiping God will be trampled underfoot, like straw is into manure. And their pride will be brought low. They'll be made nothing. And so, once again, it's sort of this picture going back to Cain. You know, Cain brings his offering of himself. It's a self-righteous offering. And... It's God. It says in the in the Hebrew that God wouldn't even give it a face. He didn't even acknowledge it, and that's what made Cain so angry, was that God wouldn't even look at it. And um, our religious attempts, God doesn't even look at. What He looks at is a heart that's submitted to Him, a heart that's willing to allow Him to use us in any way that He wants. And I pray that we will have that kind of heart. Thank you, Father, for your word. I pray that we would work with you, not the way we think you want to be worked for, but that we will work with you in the way that you lead, that your spirit will lead us, that we will go when you say go, we will stay and wait when you say wait. 
you ask us to let go of certain things in our life, that we'll let go of those things. We will take on adventures that you're leading us to, even though they seem crazy. Father, I pray that we would be valiant workers in your kingdom, that as we submit to you, that you would use us as pure and holy vessels. Thank you, Father, that you have invited us into the harvest. Lord, may we be prepared to be useful to you by submitting to you, listening to you, and simply trusting and obeying you. In Yeshua's name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.